Good morning. Uh, I uh, am happy to see a, a good crowd of uh, people joining us for this uh, this morning's webinar, which is uh, on accidental and incidental polarization effects. Basically, the effects that we don't necessarily want but need to understand to design systems. Uh, and I am John Herlocker, uh, a principal optical scientist at Bro, uh, as well as a, uh, a member of staff for technical support. Uh, I do a little of everything here, and this is one of the things that I love to do. Uh, so what I'm talking about when I describe uh, accidental and incidental effects uh, are not the things that we do intentionally with polarization or to polarization using devices that uh, that you may be familiar with like polarizers wave plates a polarization selective coating or or something else things made out of crystals things made out of anisotropic materials uh wire grids and so on uh sometimes we get polarization effects that we don't really intend where none of these quote, polarization devices, these devices with designed polarization properties uh, are present, the polarization changes anyway, somehow. And that's because all optics are polarization devices to some extent. And really, all of you who have had a physics course know this already. It's just that we often don't realize the extent of it and we need to be conscious of this when we're designing systems. So the way I'm going to try to help you uh, be conscious of this is by talking about a few simple systems, and I'll show you examples of, uh, of some of the things that go wrong in the simplest of systems, uh, and we'll talk just a little about what happens when things get more complicated, uh, but more complex systems are a subject for hours or days of discussion, so we won't go too deep. So don't be afraid that it's going to be too deep. Uh, it's going to be fun. So a simple imaging system, one of the simplest imaging systems that gives a really dramatic result that I like to talk about is an Amici prism followed by a lens. So basically what's happening here is we're completely filling one input face of the Amici prism with linearly polarized light. And in our perspective, this is kind of horizontal. I haven't shown you the coordinate system, but uh, I believe this is the x-axis in our system. Uh, we'll look at it live in ASAP in a, in a couple of minutes and, I'll, uh, and, and I can confirm that. But we basically have a reflecting roof uh, on the backside, and then we exit at a right angle to our, our input. And then we go through a lens to a detector. And one of the really dramatic things about this is amazing things happen to polarization, but if you didn't even pay attention to the polarization uh, settings, uh, there's still something very dramatic that happens in just the imaging characteristics of this. So you might expect the Erie function. Uh, this is basically a square root of irradiance uh, function at the detector. Uh, and if we ignored polarization, we would get this. We'd get a, a nice area function. But with the given polarization here, we actually see this, a pattern which clearly no longer has full radial symmetry uh, and which has essentially two mirror planes, uh, one here and one here, uh, describing its behavior. Uh, so clearly reminiscent of an airy pattern, but an airy pattern having a bad day. And uh, so this is uh, not necessarily what we want. If we're depending on imaging characteristics uh, that, this air, that the classical airy pattern would uh, describe, we're not necessarily going to get quite what we want in a system with polarization. Uh, and to take this just a little further, uh, looking at the light after the Amici prism, we see this pattern. Uh, there are, it, we now have elliptically polarized light, and because of the way the upper half is flipped from the top to bottom, the lower half is flipped from bottom to top as we go through, uh, 
we see a, uh, a line of symmetry in the pattern right through the middle. Uh, and we have elliptical polarization. So not only do we see the symmetry of the reflection, but we have some ellipticity here. Uh, whereas we started with linear uh, and horizontal polarization, we've come out of that orientation and developed a little bit of ellipticity. Uh, if we go on through the lens and we look at the polarization at the image plane, uh, that is also pretty intriguing. And you can see to some extent why we might get these uh, planes of symmetry in the uh, in the the PSF, the point spread function. Uh, there's certainly some kind of symmetry about this center. We're almost linear on axis uh, and uh, and very nearly perfectly horizontal. There's just a little bit of rotation there. And then we get uh, basically uh, we approach circular at some point. Uh, we actually are seeing the ellipse in effect rotate as we go in this direction. So uh, the polarization at the image plane is very entertaining if you like that sort of thing. Uh, and now I want to go to ASAP Live just to prove to you that I didn't just draw these things for fun, uh, that they come out of a real system. So this is uh, the system in ASAP. And uh, this is the PSF if I ignore polarization, which I can do in the same model, by the way. I do not have to uh, create a model with unpolarized light. I can simply say, ignore polarization. Uh, this is the same model. Uh, with polarization considered in the final result. Uh, this is that crazy resultant polarization at the image plane. Uh, by the way, the scale of this is not quite the scale of, uh, of this. Uh, this has a full scale plus or minus about 15 microns. Uh, this has full scale plus or minus about half that. So I'm only really looking at the polarization in the center half of this figure uh, in, in this polarization figure. But it, it, uh, it gets weaker as we go out so that we can't see the shapes as well. Uh, one thing to remind you of if you are familiar with ASAP or to tell you if you're not, is that the size of each sort of unit cell in this pattern, uh, the size of the, uh, of the figure representing the polarization is proportional to the uh, the energy, well, actually the field in that, uh, uh, well, in this case, it is energy, actually. It's proportional to the energy uh, in that uh, cell of the pattern. So as it gets smaller, that means there's less energy there. And uh, that's useful to know, and you're going to see that again later. So uh, there are no quizzes, but uh, that's something you want to pay attention to. So just to prove to you that we're really doing something here. I'm gonna to go to the uh, detector and then I'm just gonna zoom in manually. I could do it automatically, but this is more fun. Uh, you see the classic area pattern here. Uh, and this is actually log area pattern uh, or log of irradiance in this case. And uh, you can then simply hide that one and you see the polarized pattern. So I generated both of those patterns uh, at the detector, backed them off the detector just a wee bit so that they would not clash with it. And now you can see the pattern and I can always actually bring back the other one. Uh, so if you like to do side-by-side -side comparisons by just alternately doing hide view or hide visible in the 3D viewer, we can see these things. So this is a dramatic example uh, and I just, uh, I kind of wanted to lead off with that. So just to give you a little background on all of these files, uh, this is something that will be available to you uh, after the webinar. It's a project file that has all the files I've used to put together the presentation and a few extras, uh, including even the chart template files, which I'll introduce you to in a minute. Uh, so now, let's now go back to the presentation and, uh, and I'll talk a little more about why this happens. So we have some serious polarization changes in a system that 
doesn't intend to do anything to polarization. Why? Well, that's because every specular surface, every transmissive optical or reflective optical surface has polarization properties. And I don't, I don't want anyone to feel insulted like, well, I knew that already. It's not that we don't know this. And, and if you don't know that, that's fine. Uh, it, but, but you'll be learning a little bit here. Uh, at small angles of incidence, that's what AOI means here, small angles of incidence, uh, polarization effects are very small, but the S polarization, the P polarization, and the average of the two are, are plotted here as a function of angle of incidence. And as you see, it starts to split at 10 or 15 degrees, we start to see a difference. Uh, if the angle of incidence at the surface goes to 30 or 40 degrees, it becomes pretty significant and actually, in a sense, reaches its maximum relative significance for reflection out around, uh, in this case, for bare glass with an index of 1.5, out around 55 or 60 degrees, the p-polarization reflectance goes to zero. That's Brewster's angle. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon, uh, and it happens with glass or dielectric surfaces. Uh, looking at bare silver, a high reflector, uh, it's even more dramatic in some sense because the uh, the S polarization actually gets a little better uh, and the P polarization uh, gets worse. Uh, so for bare silver, it's even more dramatic than it is for, uh, in a sense, for uh, a bare glass interface. But it's something that is really worth paying attention to. Now, looking... I told you in the previous slide about reflectance, uh, but this also happens in transmission. So still the bare glass reflectance, but the bare glass transmittance is complementary to this because we're, we're assuming a lossless dielectric or, or uh, uh, dielectric interface. So uh, they have to be complementary. So you see that also transmittance has uh, an effect that mirrors this fact and the S and P polarization split significantly. And uh, so that means that we get a difference in the two components going through a system uh, when we hit a surface. So in the Amici singlet system, most of the polarization issues are occurring by reflection in the prism. Uh, the variation in transmission uh, is not so significant in this because hitting all the transmitting surfaces, we're at fairly small angles of incidence. Uh, at the input and output face, essentially we're at zero angle of incidence. At the lens, it's not a very strong lens with, with strong curvature. So it also has very small uh, uh, angle of incidence characteristic, but a variation in transmission with polarization can be really critical in fast systems. By that, I mean, for instance, high NA microscope objectives, uh, very, very fast uh, photolithography objectives, which is one of the key frontiers of challenge for this parasitic polarization science. Uh, in photographic objectives that are very fast uh, or, or simply that have extremely deep curvatures like extremely wide angle lenses, for example. Uh, and in fast telescopic objectives, though you see this less often than reflective problems because uh, so many telescopes are reflective designs, at least for the fast parts of the system, uh, for the primary uh, in particular. So we, uh, we can take that transmittance or uh, characteristic, think about the fact that the S and P polarization components split uh, in, in terms of their transmittance. One is stronger than the other. Uh, and we can actually probe a, a, a spherical surface. In this case, it's a 20 millimeter radius of curvature optic. Uh, from zero to some very high uh, field height. This field height here is 99% of the full uh, radius of the surface. We very seldom do that, but uh, in a real system, but I wanted to get this plot. So you see the angle of incidence as a function of height 
is very nearly linear until you get up to something like uh, you know, eighty percent of the full field height. So just something to keep in mind. It's sort of linear uh, up to a fairly large uh, field height and angle of incidence, but still uh, it varies. And so as we, if we were just putting a collimated beam through a lens based on this surface, uh, we see some pretty significant changes in the angle of incidence as we walk up the surface. And if we then think about that through the, the lens, pardon the pun, uh, if it even is one, of angle of incidence to transmittance, the transmittance of, of the P relative to S is going to drop as we go down. So if we had 45 degree linear polarization, the effect would be that the S component is dominating and we actually walk if there's even if there's no retardance between the two, even if we just have the attenuation in transmittance between S and P, we're going to walk the uh, the linear polarization around from uh, towards the S component direction, uh, basically towards the uh, the lateral direction, and so it would walk linear polarization around even if there were no retardance. Uh, at the surface. And that's just the way the physics works and it's it makes it interesting. Now, that was a collimated source on a spherical, a, a deeply spherical surface. Uh, let's consider a, uh, a spherical surface that is more like a typical lens with a single off-axis field uh, source point. So I'm showing the point of the point source here. Uh, this is just showing the actual rays illuminating. And then what I do is at each point where a ray hits the surface, I calculate the angle of incidence. And then I plot the angle of incidence vector uh, where the longest vectors are the largest angle of incidence and the shortest vectors are the, are the smallest angle of incidence. And if we think of this through the transmittance uh, interpretation, it means that we're going to have more of this difference between S and P transmittance over here than we do over here, for example. And it's going to show up as a change in polarization across the field. So those are all uh, things that uh, we just want to think about when we're designing, even if we don't calculate every angle of incidence. Uh, since conventional aberrations depend on angle of incidence, these polarization effects do as well. So now let's talk about a, a few other examples of really simple systems. Coming back to reflection, the reflection of a fold mirror in an, S, in an F2 beam. We're going in with 45 degree linear polarization, uh, looking at the, the way the polarization effects uh, occur and looking at some different mirror constructions uh, to see how they differ. Uh, these effects are a little bit subtle uh, at F2. Uh, so you really do need to pay attention. It's enough to cause PSF problems downstream, but not enough that everybody immediately sees the subtle differences. So first, a, a bare silver first surface mirror uh, going in with 45 degree linear polarization and coming out with uh, elliptical states that vary as we go from the effectively the bottom of the field uh, to the top coming out. Well, bottom top is all relative, but from one side of the field to the other, from the side of the field that had the lowest angle of incidence to the highest angle of incidence, we see a significant effect. Uh, if we actually measured the ellipticities, which we could do in ASAP using a command like list ellipse, then we would see pretty dramatic differences here. Very low ellipticities here, much higher here. Uh, if we look at bare aluminum for a surface mirror, well, we're closer to the ideal linear uh, polarization here. We're certainly elliptical here, but it's not as uh, it's not as dramatic a change in a sense as it is for silver. Uh, and it's it is kind of nice that the aluminum starts at the at the uh, the bottom here 
more or less uh, very close to, to linear for a lot of purposes, probably for most imaging purposes. Now, if we protect an aluminum first surface mirror with magnesium fluoride uh, quarter wave, uh, then we see something that looks a lot like the protected or like the unprotected bare first surface aluminum uh, at the bottom looks a little worse at the top. And, and this is kind of intuitive. The more, the more we, uh, more, the more layers we get involved, the, the more likely something bad happens unless we carefully design those layers to mitigate that which is something that we could do and brings in the whole realm of polarization coding design. So now let's look at aluminum in three configurations, two you've already seen. So the bare aluminum, the protected aluminum, and now bare aluminum second surface. So we're going through the glass to the aluminum, getting the aluminum from, from a, the glass side instead of the air side. Uh, and this looks really stunning. It looks great. And it, it might suggest to you that we would use aluminum second surface mirrors everywhere that we ever want to use a mirror, at least in the, the realm of the spectrum I'm in here. But there's an asterisk here for a reason. This looks great, but it is actually an oversimplified case. Uh, the case, uh, to make it completely true, I would need to change one setting in ASAP. I turned off the front surface glass reflection, which would interfere with the back surface aluminum glass interface reflection and make things a little different. Uh, but that, that involves the change of one sign on one coding uh, invocation. Uh, for those of you who know ASAP, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, so it, it's very easy to change that to make it a little more realistic, but I actually wanted to show you this dramatic result. So now let's talk about another uh, simple system. This is a reflective system uh, with two reflections. It's a poro prism, a single poro prism. And basically what we do is we go in bounce once, we actually are going through a focus in this case, which is usually not a very good idea inside a poro prism, uh, and then bouncing again and coming out. Now you notice, uh, this is an uncoated poro prism. This is an aluminum coated poro prism. So the, the two reflective surfaces are metallized with aluminum in, this, in the right case over here. Uh, so in the uncoated case, a couple of things happen. One is that uh, some gross things happen uh, due to the fact that we are not within or we're not outside the critical angle uh, for some parts of the beam. So we don't get very much energy out. Remember, the size of the polarization, uh, you know, lines or ellipses is proportional to energy here. So in this case, the energy is incredibly low. Uh, for the beams at the top and the beams at the bottom. Why is that? Because the ones on one side come out on the first interface, the ones on the other side come out at the second interface. They actually come out the back. So the top ones come out at the first interface and then the other side of the beam is attacked uh, at the second interface and we lose that energy. So polarization things are happening, clearly. We're going from linear to elliptical as we go from on axis to off, but we're also losing energy. So it's double trouble. Uh, and another thing that is worth describing here for the uncoded case, notice that the polarization ellipses for red, green, and blue, that, and those are actually three different wavelengths I'm tracing, uh, are different. And why is that? Well, it's because the index for blue is higher, meaning that the critical angle is a little smaller so that I, I can stay outside the critical angle more easily in the blue than I can in the red. And so as the index uh, decreases going from blue to red, the ability to get throughput at off, at off axis angles uh, worsens somewhat. I'll note that uh, going 
uh, to the coded version, we're going in with this circular polarization and we're coming out elliptical. Uh, whereas with the uncoded, we go in circular and even on axis to the device, not to the to, to these uh, places. Uh, we uh, we see uh, a conversion from circular to essentially linear. Okay, uh, had a momentary problem, but I I, I think it's okay now. Uh, okay, uh, so that's the Poro prism, and. Uh, Let's take a look at the actual patterns. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, this is something that you have to pay attention to in systems where we, for instance, change the optical axis by having a a, a prism or something in the way. Uh, if you don't remember to look at the pattern in the right place, you can get inf confusing results. So when I do a plot of the output polarization, if I don't remember to turn off the leaked rays, then I get that garbage uh, superimposed on the actual output polarization. By turning those off uh, and only looking at the output face, uh, I get this result. And uh, so this is just the first time I plotted this. I, you know, though I've been using ASAP for a decade or more, I didn't know why things were weird. And that was the, the solution. And here, just for a clean shot, is the output. Uh, uh, of the nicely coded pr prism. So the uh, I'm going to go to the upshot after I clear a few things. I'm just going to turn a few things off, run at least one more thing. Uh, I want to show you uh, that in this bare glass plot, and I'm just going to run it, get you the plot, and then show that... Uh, If you get this uh, project and want to actually get the same results as me, you'll want to use my chart template for polarization reflectance. And I ship that with this uh, project. Just having it in the project doesn't make it work. These have to go in a specific place. Uh, and I tell you how to find that place in the little chart templates readme. It's basically in the app data for whatever version of ASAP you're running. So just remember that if you actually want to run this and get the result, uh, but that shows the same plot that I put in the uh, in the uh, presentation. Uh, let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to show you. Uh, let's just look at the uh, uncoded Poro prism for a minute because I think seeing it in 3D is helpful. Uh, so. You can see what is happening here uh, pretty clearly, I think, when you see it in 3D. Uh, and it's the same stuff that was in the presentation, but somehow a live look at it is a little more interesting. Uh, and you might really care about the, uh, the polarization of the leaked rays. Uh, if you're putting this in an analytical instrument where that becomes some stray light in another part of the instrument, that could be pretty useful to you. Uh, and fi finally, before I get to my summary, I just want to show you an example that I really like that is a real optic that has a polarization effect that I think you might be interested in. So this is a very fast Cassegrain telescope. Uh, F.16 primary, F1 uh, for the full system. And this is the non-polarized PSF, which looks pretty good, but the polarization PSF this, you may say, gee, that looks the same, but there's a little bit of weirdness in the middle. The ring doesn't have the same width everywhere, the first dark ring. So if I turn on enhance, you actually see this whole thing has been squeezed a little bit uh, by the polarization. And if I show you the polarization there, you might get a hint as to why that's true. Uh, you see a definite bias for this 45 degree input polarization. It's very nearly 45 degrees along this diagonal and along this diagonal. But of course, 
the polarization is orthogonal between the two. So the interference you get in this direction is very different than in this direction. The, the S interference here uh, looks more like the classical Erie. The P interference across this diagonal wipes that out to some extent uh, because it is such a high NA. Uh, they don't overlap perfectly and you get a, a reduction of visibility of that fringe. So that's it for practical uh, systems. And one of the things I really want you to think about is what if we cut off, a, we only took one quadrant of that Cassegrain and made it an off-axis system. That's typical of many big telescopes. Uh, then things get even worse. It's crazy. And that's something that you want to be c conscious of in design. Uh, so now I'll go back to the presentation and we'll finish up. So we can model these unexpected and possibly undesirable polarization effect effects in ASAP. Uh, faster beams tend to excite the issues more as they do regular aberrations. Uh, the issues are driven by the angle of incidence effects on components uh, and not just classical polarization components, but as I said, all components are polarization components to some extent and at high enough angle of incidence, very dramatic. Uh, so this works in reflection or transmission for typical optical glass plastic surfaces, as well as for reflective coatings that may have a, a pretty complex dependence because of the complex index. Uh, and this is not just a curiosity. It is not just for, for geeks who look at polarization states going in and out. It affects imaging, in, and we saw that in the form of the PSF. Uh, this session intended to just introduce a little bit of how we look at that and evaluate it. Uh, and some of the things we might do to mitigate might include just keeping the uh, angles of incidence as low as possible at optical surfaces, for example. But sometimes that's not possible. A fold mirror folds 45 degrees. There's not that much you can do about that. Uh, in that case, coatings and and having mirrors buck each other's effects, for instance, might be useful. Uh, I hope that in examining a lot of a lot of material in a brief time, uh, you found it useful and interesting, at least as an introduction. I appreciate your attention, and now I'd be very interested in any questions you might have. I know it takes a while to to type a question to to chat if it's a meaty question, so I'll give you a minute or so. And uh, and we will see uh, from there. Okay, uh, so the protected aluminum in this case, uh, this was the simplest protection scheme possible. Uh, it was just a quarter wave of magnesium fluoride on aluminum. Uh, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to type that as well. So, So I'm, I'm typing the results so it'll be in the record and so that everyone can see it, even if you're having trouble hearing. Uh, uh, so it's a quarter wave mag fluoride on aluminum. Uh, And uh, so it's, there are better ways, better protected coatings. That's just a, a simple one that most people can kind of intuitively understand. So that's why I used it. Uh, okay, so the reason for change in PSF and polarization uh, in the last slide. Uh, now, 
if you're talking about this one, I'll assume you are. Uh, the the reason, and I actually need to run this again because I killed one of the uh, I killed one of the critical visual aids. Uh, so in this case, uh, with the classical uh, or with the polarization PSF, which I will enhance uh, so that we can really see it, the what is happening is that when when these components in this diagonal, the the diagonal that goes from the first to the to the third quadrant, it's S. Those are S polarization. Well, I think of it as S because the bisector between them. Uh, would would make it an S polarization. Those can fully interfere. They have perfect overlap, so they interfere just like unpolarized radiation in a sense. Uh, there is no reduction in visibility of when you interfere this ray with this ray. However, if you interfere this ray with this ray, uh, Let's see if I can think of a way to illustrate this. Uh, I, I probably can't in a pinch. Uh, I think I, the, uh, the key thing is that if I interfere this ray with this ray, and that is, and this is, uh, uh, and they're, let's just say for fun that they're at 30 degrees relative to each other. Those are not in plane vectors, those vectors are actually. Uh, approaching at an angle. Actually, I do believe I can find a way to illustrate this to you if I can get enough of the geometry out of the way. Uh, I think, if I'm lucky, that I can move this up, zoom in, really zoom in. And so, okay, I'm going to have to hide more geometry. Uh, you see, this is not a planar polarization characteristic. It is. It has slight curvature, and so if this ray and this ray, the two two diagonals that are, uh, or that are cross diagonal, uh, then they interfere with no reduction of visibility. This ray and its opposing ray have a slight angle. They are not collinear. Therefore, the visibility is reduced by that cosine factor for the overlap. So their visibility is somewhat reduced because they do not perfectly interfere. Uh, there's some non-interfering component uh, to that that becomes background. And that keeps this part of the ring from going all the way to null. So uh, let's see. It would be great if I rotated this 45 degrees. but you can see this null is very close to the baseline, uh, whereas this null is not. There's a great difference in visibility for that fringe, if you think of it as a fringe, uh, relative to the, the, uh, the other one. I hope that helps. Uh, let's see, so now I have, uh, does the analysis in ASAP work equally well for coherent sources as well? Uh, this this uh, polarization works, uh, m virtually all polarization features in ASAP uh, work, and everything I've shown you today works for coherent mode as well as for incoherent. Uh, so uh, there, I would say, if you're doing polarization work using some of our new polarizer and retarder models, you want to be careful with polarized because I still can't claim that we have tested every possible uh, way they can interact. But for incoherent, everything works. For coherent, uh, everything I've shown you today works. All conventional imaging and uh, isotropic surface modeling works. Okay, uh, so my next question is uh, about the, uh, just looking at the details of the INR file and how the polarization dependent reflectance uh, 
versus AOI comes in for the aluminum surface. And uh, so let me get you the, I will show you, let's see, I'll find aluminum. There's first surface aluminum, so should be able to show you that. Um, so what I've done uh, is I'm actually using uh, data and I don't remember, oh, this is not aluminum. This is silver. Where's my aluminum data? Oh, right there at the top. Sorry. Uh, the big volume of silver data uh, caught my attention. Uh, so the aluminum data is a, is a fairly compact data set. Uh, and I'm actually using the complex index uh, form, the... Uh, the real and imaginary part complex index form for aluminum. Uh, and it actually, it independently correlates uh, and interpolates the real part and imaginary part uh, to get a complex index. And so, so the polarization dependent reflectance with angle of incidence for aluminum is being so well, intricate, having having such features is because uh, we have this complex part, which has the effect of giving us uh, some retardance. So we don't just have a pure amplitude effect here. We have a phase effect as well that causes that uh, polarization dependent reflectance uh, to, to happen as it does for silver or aluminum. Does that help? Great, fantastic. Uh, any more? Okay. I I saw something pop up a summary window. Oh, okay. Uh, it popped up so quickly that I didn't notice it scrolled. So the elliptical PSF uh, could be could so this is this is an observation. The elliptical polarized PSF from fast system could be confused with a standard PSF, uh, but from the same system with an elliptical pupil uh, for some pupil vignetting, uh, how would you identify which effect you have when you only measure and see the PSF? Well, if I could do anything I want, which in simulation, we can do whatever we want. In the lab, we can't necessarily. Uh, if I could do whatever I want, if there's any way for me to uh, to rotate the pupil, I can I can separate the effects. Uh, that's not too likely. If I, but I may be able to manipulate. Uh, as in rotate the polarization, even in a real system where all I'm seeing is the PSF uh, as a measurement, uh, I can rotate the input polarization and I should be able to select them. Uh, effectively, what I need to do is excite the eigenmodes in, in different ways so that I can, can split the two effects apart. Now, it is possible to conspire in a way that they're hard to separate. Uh, but, uh, I think, uh, I think usually if, uh, if we can rotate the, uh, the polarization or not just rotate, but change the state of polarization, we may be able to pull that out. Uh, that's not a very crisp answer, but I, I've, I've done these kinds of things, but it really is system dependent on exactly what's possible. Uh, is that helpful? If not, I'll be happy to, to, to talk with you more about it at length. Uh, so, very good questions. I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, is there anything else? I didn't miss any, did I, as things were scrolling by? Okay, good. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I will say once again, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate your time. I hope that for those of you who use ASAP that you want to go off and play with this, we'll get the project posted so you can use it. 
And uh, for those of you who haven't played with ASAP, I hope this may motivate you to check it out. Uh, we are happy to, uh, to talk with you about what you can do, and we can do trials and things like that to give you a chance to try it. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again sometime.